Hello everyone and it's a big warm welcome to the Head of Zoo's Facebook live discussion entitled Writing Disability, Caregiving and Family Dynamics in conversation with the talented Louise Fine and Victoria Scott. I'm delighted to welcome both Louise and Victoria to the virtual stage tonight to discuss a topic that undeniably in fiction is undertalked, packed with emotion, but also full of hope and entertainment. I'm sure tonight there will be a few tears, but a lot of laughter as well. Feel free to say hello in our comments below. And can I ask everyone to put your questions in the comments and check out the links to buy both of these wonderful thought-provoking books. In the meantime, we will try to avoid any spoilers. Before I introduce these two ladies, let's start with a background introduction. First up, Louise Fine with an MA in Creative Writing from St Mary's University London, an author of People Like Us. This debut novel shortlisted for the RSL Christopher Bland Prize and the RNA Historical Novel of the Year Award 2021. Her second novel, The Hidden Chair, out in September, is set in the 1920s England, and it tells the story of Edward and Eleanor Hamilton, who together with their four-year-old daughter Mabel, have the perfect life with a bright future. Edward is one of the leading men of the eugenics movement, and Eleanor the adoring wife. But when Mabel starts suffering from seizures, his daughter's epilepsy becomes an embarrassment for him to hide, just one of their very undesirable conditions Edward campaigns against. Author Louise has an interesting background, a past career in banking and law. She also ran a consultancy business. Her first book, People Like Me, was inspired by family history. And it's these personal links that are apparent in her second book, The Hidden Child. Louise, can you welcome and can you tell us a little bit more about your sort of writing journey to start with and what The Hidden Child is about? Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Um, Yes, I have always, like I think many, many authors, wanted to write since the time I could read, um, but I never really considered it to be a proper career. Um, I had to earn a living, and um, so I went down the path of law and then into banking, and then I had my own um, finance consultancy business, which I ran when my older two children were um, fairly small. Um, my my third child um, was born, everything was wonderful. And then when she was two, she developed um, a very rare severe seizure disorder. Um, she had on average 100 seizures a day um, for over a year before the seizures came under control. Um, so she was very poorly indeed. And um, during that time, she sort of suffered um, a, a brain damage essentially um and uh at the time i carried on working it was almost like an escape for me um but as she started to get better i felt she really needed me around more and it was at that time that i saw an advertisement for um this master's degree in writing your first novel which seemed absolutely perfect for what i wanted to do um so my husband said, just go for it. There's never going to be a perfect time. So I did. Um, and I thought, I'll give myself a year to write this first novel, do the degree. Of course, the year turned into several. Um, but the result of that was my first novel, People Like Us. Um, and I'm now lucky enough to be um, a full time writer. Um, so People Like Us came out in the pandemic last year, which was not ideal, but hopefully this one will actually see a shop, <laughs> which will be great. Um, but yeah, I, I absolutely love writing and it's great to be able to combine that with family life. Thanks, Louise. What a really interesting story about how you came to write. And Victoria, um, with your debut novel, Patience, which is out now, you actually were a journalist for two decades um, with an English degree from King's College and a postgraduate diploma in broadcast journalism. Um, you've got vast portfolio from the BBC to Time Out and The Telegraph. Um, but you've had quite an interesting journey from being a journalist. You went through the Faber Academy writing a novel course course mm -hmm. and you've already your new your debut book patience and I'm not surprised about this at all I have to say has already um been 
uh, promoted as a fiction book of the month by the Booksellers Association. Um, your book follows the plight of the Willows family and one of their daughter's patients has Rett syndrome, a neurological condition which affects the ME. MECP2 gene and it can cause multiple disabilities and medical complexities and um, then they have the option of having a new gene therapy which could present a possible cure and the family face a near impossible dilemma opinions in the family become divided and there's big consequences for it patience has been a long time coming for you uh, Victoria mm -hmm. I believe you had a draft of it initially entitled Rets and you stored it away until you went on the Faber course as a fellow journalist I've moved over to fiction from um, sort of journalism and there's a, there's a big difference but also there's an element of um, similarities at the end of the day you're telling the story um, I wanted to know what promoted this career change why did you suddenly decide to to go into fiction I don't think it was sudden I think I ha I mean I have always written fiction I've written I wrote terrible poems and terrible plays that I used to subject my family to when I was very small um, I'm sure they're still there somewhere um, I tried to write my first novel about age nine I think it was about five pages and um, so I've always wanted to do it and actually journalism kind of came about because I wanted to write and I wanted to be creative with words and it was a thing I was best at. It was pretty much the only thing I was really good at was writing. So I pursued journalism and I, yes, I became a broadcaster. I'd worked at the BBC for a, a long time, um, a news producer on um, the news channel and the, and the six o'clock news and the one o'clock news and stuff like that. Um, moved aboard the Middle East for six years and because, uh, because of doing that, ended up working for lots of different outlets, um, doing bits of freelance reporting and, and newspapers and websites and things. And now I lecture in journalism. So I, I do that part time. I, I lecture at uni. Um, but uh, the writing, as, as, as you know, I did have a like 40,000 words I wrote, but I'm not sure they were very good 40,000 words. And I kept it on my hard drive. <laughs> I started just after my son was born and he's now 11 and I parked it and then um yeah uh, I turned 40 and had that kind of midlife crisis kind of a positive midlife crisis and a bit like Louise my husband said go on do it finish your book and I went all right then so I did um but patience just to explain um so Louise and I are similar in that, that these books, um, Louise is the Hidden Child and my book Patience are both inspired by something that happened in our private lives in our family life and my sister my wonderful sister Claire who's now 41 has something called Rett syndrome which as you correctly said um, it's a genetic disorder it's neurological um, when it when people get confused genetic doesn't mean hereditary as in it doesn't mean you pass it on to your kids it can just mean that it's a random mutation which is what Rett syndrome is just a random chance that happens but um, but the thing that got me started 11 years ago on that book was uh, on the idea was some research done uh, by scientists in this in the States that they gave some uh, mice Rett syndrome and then they did gene therapy on them. And apparently these mice were completely fine. The disability was completely reversed. And that to me was just an astounding thing. And the fact that these trials are coming, in fact, the first human trials are actually starting next year. So the coincidence and given the long timeline in publishing is quite amazing. <laughs> it's happening right now. Um, it, it, that is what I started this book with a question. And I guess the book is my answer to that to that question. So it was inspired by my amazing sister and patients who has Rett syndrome is who I would imagine my sister to be because she and I have never been able to communicate because she can't speak or or any kind of communication or, or sign or anything. Um, so we communicate without words. And uh, she and I have been doing that for four decades and more. And so, yeah, patience is kind of the, the person I, I imagine my sister to be. And that's it. You know, you've both had this personal experience with family members. And I think you're both passionate about sort of breaking the silence around the stigma of physical and mental disabilities. I know, Louise, um, when you reviewed Victoria's Patients, you said that severe disability is rarely explored in fiction and almost never giving voice to severely uh, disabled protagonists. So um, I know that you've, you've both sort of, we were talking earlier, weren't we, on this call about how you've both read each other books do you both strive to find comparative books or do you write from the heart is it something that you know you just 
felt compelled to write because of your experiences. And do you feel that there's, there is much representation out there? I know you've found comfort in each other's books in different ways. Louise? I definitely write from the heart. Um, both of my books have been sort of um, inspired by um, family events in that sense. But um, I think, do I seek out books? Um, I seek out books which open my eyes, as we were talking earlier, to um, places, people, experiences that, that I don't have. And I felt that by writing this book, I could open other people's eyes to these events, which I have had experience of. Um, the same with, with Victoria's book. It's um, unless you've been in that position, it's quite difficult to... Um, you know, to portray something. Um, for my book, it is historical fiction. So I did do a lot, a lot of research. And in the way that I, what I loved about Victoria's book is that Patience has this voice and it is giving voice to those people who are always unheard. And in my book, um, I, I investigated a lot of people who had been put in institutions and one of the most grueling aspects was looking at all the pictures of these people in the case books that I went through and I kind of felt like I really had to study each one really carefully because it was probably the only time they got a public viewing um, and, and, and I just my heart just really went out to each and every one of them and I think that's um, something I wanted to try and achieve. And I think you did that really well. I mean, I I, I read, as you know, I loved your book. Um, and I, I thought uh, I didn't know anything about the really the reality of those institutions and the baby castle where the, the young ones were kept. It just oh, my heart broke. Um, yeah. Uh, but in in sense of, I mean, I'm the same as as Louise. I'm completely right from the heart. If if you read Patience, you can tell because I think probably there's a huge amount of my heart spilled out into that book. Um, it's the book of my soul, as they say. Um, but uh, there isn't much representation. Louise is right for severe disability. Uh, there is a fair amount of fiction which examines things like autism, um, but I hadn't read anything written. I mean, the thing about Rett syndrome is. Um, until very, very recently, uh, it was thought that rep women and primarily it affects women um, didn't have an un any much understanding. Um, and people were thought, you know, understanding of a child or a toddler. Um, but actually, um, a lot of younger rep people are learning to use eye gaze technology now, which is where they, they control a computer using the, the movements in their eyes. Um, we're learning that actually they have a lot more understanding. And so that was kind of what got me going on writing this book, because I thought there was an opportunity there to explore the life of someone who is treated as if they are, you know, a, a constant child, but they're actually a fully blown adult right there. And, and it, it, um, something I've always questioned uh, myself, but equally, I'm equally aware that I am not my sister and, and I am her able bodied sister. And so there was this huge responsibility that I felt writing it. Um, I thought long and hard and I did research just like Louise, but not not looking at those pictures. But I, I spoke to um, parents of rep people, including my own parents, um, to ask about their own experiences. And I had a little I, I would say have a chat with Claire. And I always say that. But, you know, Claire looks at me and I talk to her. But um, uh, I really thought about it. But the why I did it. I mean, obviously, I'm not claiming to represent anyone or what Claire really is thinking. But why I did it was I wanted to start that conversation and I wanted people to wonder what that person's thinking and accommodate that and look at them more if they see them in public or say hello or ask, you know, really just engage more. People never involve Claire in anything and people, you know, get embarrassed and they don't look. And I feel like just go through your life being ignored. And I think that's wrong. So that's why I wrote it. I wrote it so that a little bit more attention can be paid and, and, and a conversation can be started. And I think what's really interesting um, in both yours, Louise, with, with your viewpoints and how you've written it, and we'll come on to that in a minute, um, but with you, Victoria, with Patience, about how you divided these viewpoints up. So Patience, um, you know, the, the daughter who's got the Rett syndrome, you gave her a voice, you gave her a first person monologue, and yet you wrote the other characters, the dad, Pete, the sister, Eliza, the mom, Louise, in third person. Um, 
that was so interesting because what you got was this sense of patience as being vivacious. She's so funny. I mean, we talked about this earlier. She really, she's had me laughing out loud and my children's really laughing at mommy. Rude. She's rude. She's brilliant. She's on the ball. She's the kind of girl you'd want as your best friend. And she's got this internal monologue going on, but nobody's hearing it. And it was really interesting very clever how you did these different viewpoints and how you wrote in the different tenses and I wanted to know sort of how how did you find that writing in all these different tenses you know how was no, that as an author but the dull answer to that is is I didn't really notice like I just did it um it was instinctive the whole first person for patients thing it just felt you know I was in you know I wanted her to talk to people she's talking to herself and to other people um and for the others, I don't know, I, I find it really easy writing in third person. I feel just as close to a character in that. And so I, I think I instinctively just wrote it that way. I didn't have to change it after I got an agent or anything. I started that way and I finished that way. And I, I just wanted Patience to stand out. And she fell onto the page that way. And I, think, I wasn't going to uh, argue with her, so I left it. <laughs> that's amazing. As I've interviewed a lot of authors, and sometimes I've had them say, I've had to rewrite 50,000 words because well, I've done it in the wrong tense. Too. And, <laughs> you know, I, I think that's amazing. Abnormal. I mean, obviously, I did editing. <laughs> Everyone edits, but um, yes. I, I didn't change the viewpoints, yeah. That's amazing. And interestingly, Louise, so you have the viewpoint of Edward and Eleanor, the mum and the dad, but also you throw in this viewpoint, um, a personification of epilepsy, which is actually really poetic when you read it. And it really drew me in this idea, instead of giving Mabel, the child who had epilepsy, a voice like Victoria did with patients, what you actually did is give epilepsy a voice. And it was almost, I think that you were saying, um, you know, in, in research that I've read, that you have things that you've said before, that it was when your own daughter was diagnosed, it was like a monster on your shoulder kind of thing. And that's what you sort of get with these epilepsy chapters. Um, it was so interesting and such a break from the normal narrative and dialogue. What made you make that conscious decision not to give Mabel a voice, but to give the epilepsy a voice? I'm, I'm laughing because it's the exact opposite <laughs> of what Victoria <laughs> Head. So mm. I had actually, I'm, I'm a terrible, I, I, I don't plan, I'd love to say I planned it all this way, I didn't. Um, I was actually trying to write uh, from Mabel's perspective, she is very young, she's four, and it just wasn't working. Um, and out of nowhere, literally out of nowhere, this, this epilepsy character came in and I just thought, I'll, I'll just, just try it, I'll just see how that goes. Um, and, and that worked much better than Mabel. So Mabel got dropped and um, I kept this voice. And as you say, it came from our own experience of, of epilepsy sort of stealing away our daughter. I mean, literally all her skills, she lost everything, her, her speech, her sort of play skills, everything was lost at, to this monster. Um, and I've heard, I, I've read, I read a lot of other books written by people who've experienced epilepsy and often they referred to it in a similar way. It was this thing, this creature, um, in the same way that people sometimes describe cancer as a, as a being. Um, and it gave me the ability to describe what was happening to Mabel when she had no voice. Um, and it also felt right because Mabel as a character had no power, no voice, nothing um so that so it sort of felt right that she was silent in the book because it it showed her inability to have a say over her future louise actually i was just thinking that it's really interesting that parallel um you know talking about what happened to your daughter and with Rett syndrome that's exactly what my parents went through with claire yeah. and so that's what louise yeah. and pete go through in the book with patients where she appeared completely normal and they thought mm -hmm. they had this healthy normal girl and then this thing came along and stole everything away mm -hmm. so they they had to watch as yeah. she lost her speech and walking and all of these things and it's the same horrendous experience yeah. and, I, and I could relate so well to your Louise in your book because um as the mother obviously that that was a similar experience but it's it's very lonely and um that isolation and how she felt came across so strongly um and and actually the way you did it 
all in the round. I know we're coming on to family dynamics, but it worked so brilliantly because you completely showed all those different experiences and it does affect the sibling just as much as the other members yeah. of the family. I mean, that was the perspective I was really capable of giving because that is that is yeah. my perspective. And, I, and going back to representation, I haven't really read that anywhere. Um, no. So I wanted to write that. I wanted other people who have disabled siblings to read that and go, yes, someone's heard me. Someone knows how I felt. It was important. Yeah. And I think it's that group dynamics between the family members and this guilt almost. There's this sense, isn't there, of this, um, that they, you know, particularly Louise in yours, it was set in the 1920s. It's very different time then. You know, it was about they wanted a normal child and they would talk about you know Eleanor said what's wrong with her and they weren't understanding obviously back then the 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 the, the science side of it and what was really going on and then we're trying to get the treatment both for Mabel but also for patients about this question of what is normal so Pete for patients patient's dad you know he said that he felt that she was happy and she was cont contented that was her normal I think we're talking COVID about the new normal what is normal and I think for you know Mabel that was her um but they would keep the parents in particular and probably you know the siblings as well would remember how they were before patients you know she had this sense of being able to talk and so on and Mabel and then the diseases took over and that's what changed them and I think that you know back then particularly for Eleanor and Edward they wanted well particularly Edward with his position with his job wanted to fit into society it's a sense of how to fit into society and I think Louise you said that disability itself is De debatable so a condition one person might regard as a di disability could another be regarded as simply a difference and I think this is what we have in both your books is this sense of the characters debating that in their own head this moral um moral versus medicine almost isn't it Louise did you find that through all the research that you did I know you trawled all back through all the archives and so on and I know you You've talked about the pictures but did you find that was coming through that there were questions about is this the right thing to do and this sense of society at the time I think um in in the 20s and well I suppose now I mean who doesn't want a normal child with without all these difficulties everyone wants their child to be healthy at the end of the day um but it was a real, I mean, it's still a stigma, but it was even more of a stigma in those days. And so there was this feeling that if they weren't quite right, you hid them away or just got rid of the problem and put them in an institution. Um, and and the, the dividing line between what's normal and what isn't normal was much wider. <laughs> I mean, it's a horrible way to describe things anyway, mm. but, you know, um, in those days, they would institutionalize anyone for, you know, if you were an alcoholic or you you were, you know, from a really poor background or, you know, for multiple different reasons, um, people were put in institutions when they were actually perfectly fine um, and didn't need to be there. So there's always that, that where do you draw the line? And, and then that brings you on to, well, what is normal? <laughs> so... Yeah, I mean, it, it's 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 um, it's something that's totally relevant today. Um, and what do we value? What, what you know, we value intelligence almost unquestionably above other other things. And I wanted to raise that as a question. Um, is that the most important thing? What about kindness and what about other things? Um, yeah. And I think arguably, you know, in patient's case with you, Victoria, people assumed that she wasn't intelligent. They assumed by sort of looking at her that she hadn't got that level of intelligence. And so I guess, you know, what 
you're both sort of saying in your books is actually not to assume, not to take things at face value. And actually, you know, she you gave her that internal voice of the things that she was observing and that the, she was locked into herself with the syndrome, but she was actually still, you know, very bright and thinking about what was going on yeah. around her and observing. Definitely, definitely trying to challenge people's perceptions of what um, severely disabled people are capable of um, and what they might be um, in terms of their intelligence, but also, I mean, yes, just to just get people thinking about um, and, and trying to say to them, you know, imagine if this were you. I, essentially, I'm trying to get everyone to try and put themselves in the position of that person who's got an itch they can't scratch or a pain they can't tell someone about. Patience says, thinking about normal, she says at one point, um, I don't like, I don't much like the look of the mess most normal people, inverted commas, make in their lives you know um i'm not sure i fancy any of that or something like that um and and uh, i i do think that too i mean you know she says i'm oh, the mess they make of their lives and we can all see that too and and my sister is um whilst profoundly disabled a really very happy soul she adores music she responds really strongly to music both positively and and if it's sad quite you know she might cry um it, it it's sort of right direct into her into her soul that and she's she laughs she smiles she is loved she is safe she is content and it that definitely is is so cool. much more than many normal people achieve I think mm, yeah. there's so definitely that, a sense of that it was it was really a nice perception that actually who are we to judge what is right and what's wrong and, and what's quality of life not 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 mm, just yeah. normal but quality of yeah. life and that and, and yeah. there is always or quite commonly an assumption um that that people like my sister don't have a quality of life and particularly during covid there was that awful thing with the suggestion of no, do not resuscitate orders for people like her in hospital and that is just abhorrent frankly who are we to judge what someone's quality of life is especially if yeah. they can't tell you and um, yeah. oh. and you and you brought that question so brilliantly forward with this gene therapy concept and should they go forward with it and mm. having to make that decision on behalf of her you, they were forced to think about that, and that yeah because that's exactly what's brilliant. at the core of the novel is they're yeah. given this opportunity do they go with it do they not and Pete really doesn't want to and Louise the mum wants to and that's quite normal too I think I think you know we really normal to, to fall down either side of that and because there are risks involved in gene therapy I should say it, it's some quite severe risks at this stage um so it, it I wanted to ask that question exactly thanks Louise yeah that's exactly what it was doing and I think that's that's also what causes and we you look at both the physical disabilities in the book but the mental ones and when Louise and Pete have got to make those decisions about patients you know Louise falls apart and she finds it very difficult she's got a lot of stress going on anyway but then she's feeling mom guilt and she's feeling this guilt and mm. she's got to then make a decision about patients does she have this gene therapy Pete's got opposing you know um sort of viewpoint and they're just normal um, humans right they're flawed ordinary humans and that's the other thing I really wanted to put across and Louise will I mean having looked after her daughter and gone through that scary phase will know that I, I'm sure she can tell us in a bit um, but you know that that parent thing you're, you're sort of treated like this amazing angel who's going to look after the, you know nursing this child you know so so um selflessly but actually just a normal human who's got problems of your own and and you put in Louise's case a business to run um, and lots of other things going on and you're trying to hold it all together with like sticky tape and it's coming apart at the seams and I really wanted to tell that story too yeah I think it's did. a brilliant mm -hmm. quote and where Louise says about the hospital nurses and she says that the hospital nurses knew her so well, they looked into parts of her soul that even she didn't want to see. And I felt that was so powerful because I know, Victoria, you interviewed your own mom and you interviewed um, other parents who'd got sort of children or adult children with vet syndrome. And I felt that just summed it up, like you're saying, that she was a flawed character because she is human and there is only so much that people can cope with. Um, did you sort of, how important was it to get these caregivers' voice across, you know, these people who are doing it day in, day out? Oh, really important because also, I mean, there are, there's an army of carers in this country um, doing unpaid caring. Um, they're just, you know, often having to give up their jobs, having to get, certainly give up... Um, you know, full time work, um, masses of income to look after their family members. And um, it is a 
really thankless task often. And I wanted to show what the reality of that is. Because my mum had to give up her very promising career to look after um, my sister. And she founded a charity in the end. She founded the Ret uh, UK charity and did some amazing stuff and got an MBE for health. But what she really wanted to be doing was university lecturing, which is what she started off doing. And and um, her life took a completely different direction due to having a disabled child. And I wanted to show that that's the reality for loads of people. And no one really talks about it and it's not yes. discussed much in the news. And yet there are hundreds of thousands, millions of people in this country doing it right now. So I wanted to to, to voice that. And and um, Louise, I mean, you, you I, I think, I mean, your personal experience has so many parallels here. This is what yeah, I was going to ask, you know, with your role yeah. as a mother, you know, the ultimate mm -hmm. caregiver in both your books and with Eleanor, you know, the, she picked up straight away that her daughter, um, Mabel, something was wrong, this instinct reaction, you know, there's a darkness in the little girl's eyes, once or twice she stops mid-chatter, and right from the beginning, it, it's those mothering instincts that something's wrong and that she needs to do something about it, and obviously you've been there, Louise, like Victoria said, you know, you've been there with your own daughter, how important was it for you to portray this mother care, caregiving role and what she was going through? Yeah, I mean, the, the mother-child role was obviously very key um, part of the, the story. Um, and especially at the time, women obviously had a, had, well, I say a very different position in society. I think actually nowadays, whilst we think women have all this freedom, if you are a carer, you really don't. Um, and that, sorry, I'm talking about Victoria's book now <laughs> rather than mine, but <laughs> in Victoria's book, what, so, what I thought you did really well as well was the whole financial worry is, 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 is so key because mm. one breadwinner is taken out of the, out of the equation, you know, almost every time. And because, because of that, the husband had to work harder and be away um that was kind of the case in in our family and it put stress on the relationship as well as you know just the whole situation so that was brilliantly done going back to my book in the in the 1920s i mean obviously in and and this was a sort of upper class family where money wasn't such a worry but she she had no real say or power in what happened to the child um that it was it was usually the husband and what I what I wanted to show was how um, Eleanor's sort of love for her child really um, changed things at the end of the day. That um, bit made me I mean her that relationship um, Eleanor's love for Mabel made me cry um, and there was a I think there was a, the bit where I don't want to spoil but I mean I'm not going to spoil but but basically you know she she would she she's with her daughter and she's feeling emotional about what's going on and she and the way you describe it and again I think it's because of the Rett syndrome regression and the fact that Claire used to have skills she doesn't have any more and that's exactly what you're describing there it just really got me in the feels I really did you did it really well thank you well, I think yours made was... me cry too so oh. <laughs> get your issues handy <laughs> sorry you both had me in bits I mean there was the sense made me laugh. Of... I mean I hope she made you laugh did patients make you laugh she as did well? she did I just you know as a mom you get this sense where you really get it don't you and I think where Louise picked up the patients had got a broken collarbone and she just knew she mm. kept going and she this this is tiger mm. mom in all of us isn't there that we we won't let something man. lie it's when it comes real. to our kids yeah mm. and I think like with Louise as well you know this she's doing this research isn't she Eleanor she's methodically doing it and she won't give up and back mm. then as well you know a, a woman wasn't heard was she so she, you know that makes yeah. it even more sort of compelling that she did mm. that but these female strong female characters that came through in both the books particularly the mother figure um really did get me as a mom <laughs> mm. uh, and I did you know I did laugh as well it was I mean particularly yours Victoria the I think what I found some black humour in it in terms of the things like talking about um, the the reality of day to day. And actually, you couldn't help but, you know, sort of laugh at the way patients observed everybody else. And there was this kind of lightness to it in, in that respect that you had got this really injected this humour into her but character, I, which was brilliant. 
I do think that, I mean, in our family, there's always been a lot of laughter as well. And I think there is laughter as well in dark times. You know, one of the things that we all do to cope, I think, is to find humour in difficult times. And so Patience finds humour in everything. And because, you know, not much happens and she starts to sort of, you know, she's she's having this little chat with herself and she is outrageously rude about other people, but also rude about herself and self-deprecating. And obviously, you know, the, the reality is that you were very, um, you were sort of being very nice about it. But the reality is, you know, things like going to the toilet and stuff when when you're disabled is, you know, very problematic. Um, and there's somebody else involved and they're watching you and stuff. So I kind of didn't want to shy away from that either because mm. that's just life, you know. And I think if you think about that as, as a person who's able to take yourself to the toilet without someone watching, um, uh, then uh, you, that changes the way you think about that person and I wanted that to be the case I wanted people to realize that it's not just um you're not just that person who's perfectly well presented who you see walking past you or push past you in the street um mm. they have to be looked after and we need by the way we need more carers we need better better paid carers in this country um mm. there's a massive social care crisis that is a big problem right now absolutely I mean, not, not that this is a time for politics but um mm. hopefully that's also raised in the book um that mm. I, I want you know, I think it is. I think, you know, particularly in the character Jimmy, you know, what he gives to patients, what he gives to the family, that calm with the storm going on and the care that he gives. I mean, we're, yeah, so you know, we're all going to get... Sorry, I don't, in case people yeah. haven't read it, male carer in patients is a uh, bungalow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's it and he you know he comes in as a carer or already you think oh it's a male carer because you you don't get that many male carers and um, but the time that he spends with them in the can we're all you know going to be frail and vulnerable one day and you think oh gosh I would like somebody like that to look after mm -hmm. me but yeah you're right Victoria that they're, they're not you know sort of they're paid. not and I think they're not valued and, and Claire's had some wonderful mm -hmm. carers and I and I just feel very strongly that we should be valuing them more and I think also what came across from the, although we've got these strong female women, I think there was a vulnerability. And what sort of came across was that they were both reticent to ask for help. So Eleanor had said to the postman, you know, oh, there's no, no need to mention it and so on. Because obviously in society times, she didn't want to get anybody here wind of it. And also Louise didn't particularly want the weekend carers there. And she just wanted to try and do it herself. And she didn't want Pete there to help with patients. And it's this sense of, is there a stigma in asking for help, do you think? Louise, have you found that? Um, is there a stigma? Yeah, yes, probably. Um, I know that when my daughter was poorly, I didn't ask for enough help. Um, I tried to cope and tried to cope and tried to cope until I couldn't really cope. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think there's definitely a sense that you just think you can keep going. Um, or maybe you just try. Um, and actually, you do need to ask for help. Um, isn't, because... that, isn't that the mum guilt thing as well? It, it's that thing about you feel that you should be the one looking after your child and yeah. admitting that you can't cope is a big, yeah. guilty step. Like you're feeling really guilty about that. Um, yeah. yeah. My mum certainly, I think, pushed herself to her absolute limits. Yeah, yeah um, definitely. And, and and if you've got other children as well, you feel doubly guilty because you feel guilty about them as well. And, and the you know, at the end of the day, the person that ends up, being the most destroyed is 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 you because you're trying to keep going for everyone else mm -hmm. yeah I think it was said wasn't it um that in uh, your book Victoria parents care for children who gradually pull away from them carers care for someone who only grows to need them more and that really summarized it for me and I guess that's what you're saying Louise in your sort of home situation Coming on to the siblings, which I know, Louise, you just touched on, uh, you've got the mum guilt of feeling like you're not giving the time to both mm -hmm. of them. Um, I know that Eleanor in your book has got Jimmy and then she's got Mabel and she's torn. Yeah. I know, Victoria, you've got Eliza. Is Louise ignoring what she's going through? She's still on her radar. And then you've got Patience. So... Mm -hmm. Is that something that you sort of deliberately wanted to explore, both of you, this sibling sort of, not rivalry, but, you know, they both need attention. Just because you're 30 doesn't mean to say you don't need your mom. So is that something you both wanted to explore? Uh, shall I go first? And then I'll, I'll pass over to you, Louise. I don't, yeah, definitely. I um, 
Um, it was deliberate. I am a sibling of a severely disabled person that's defined my life um, in really good ways uh, as well as difficult ones. Um, and I really felt that I wanted to explore all that. And it's not really been done in fiction before that, that, I've, that I've found anyway. Um, and there's that unique sense of being responsible, like feeling like you've got to run for two and be that child who gets married and graduates and has grandchildren for the grandparents. Um, but also that feeling of perhaps not being given the attention that you want or for your parents' attention, certainly being diverted often by crises and medical needs and trips to hospital and all of those things. So, yeah, it was really important um, for me that that was included. Um, Louise, how about you? Yeah, so it was a slightly different situation for in my book because Jimmy was a baby and um, he came second and... Um, Eleanor struggled to bond with him. And I think, again, that's something that's not very well explored in fiction is sometimes mothers do struggle to bond with their children and it's seen as kind of unnatural and, um, uh, and, and sometimes it takes longer to bond with a child. And for Eleanor, she struggled because um, of what happened to Mabel. Mabel was sent away and she felt I suppose, guilty, and that got in the way of her enjoying um, Jimmy. Um, so that whole complex love thing was all messed up. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was her coming to terms with all of it um, in the book. And I think not only did it affect those sibling dynamics, it clearly affected marital relations and yeah. you know that was quite raw in some parts for both of your books this sort of difference of opinion difference of way of doing things which you always get with a partner don't you but it it when you've got then a pressurized you know situation of of trying to do the right thing about your child and you're put in unexpected circumstances that really heats sort of the pressure cooker up doesn't it and how important was it to convey that because I know both of you have done so much sort of research in, into the areas as well as your own personal experience as well uh Shall I go first this time? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I mean, it's it's a, it's a well known fact that if you've got a child with with additional needs, it really does um, affect your relationship. Not surprisingly, um, and I think for writing about a relationship in the nineteen twenties when. Um, the balance of power was probably quite different to how it is now. I really wanted to explore that as well during that time. Women were gaining a lot more um, sort of rights, and they were doing jobs that they hadn't done before. And there was things like birth control. Um, so it was a time of quite a lot of social change, which sort of comes into the book um, a little bit through Eleanor's sister Rose. Um, and uh, Edward struggled to cope with all of that, as well as um, the fact that he had this child that he didn't really want um so of course it it puts stress on the relationship so I really yeah. liked Edward though the thing about I thought I really like really effective about your book because you read the the blurb and it says that he's a eugenicist and you're like oh right <laughs> and then actually you managed to make him likable and understand like you could sort of see how he got himself in that mess and that he sort of I mean I don't want to spoil it but you know you know he goes through a journey and um as much as I hated his views, you could see that he was a human, and that yeah. he. And, and I mean, that, yeah, you know, it, it just sorry, just on on Edward. Um, uh, he so obviously he was a child of his time, and those views were very widespread at the time. Um, they're awful to us now, but at the time, everyone accepted them. Um, but he was also. I, I wanted to explore a little bit about the male side because he men are expected to be a certain way and certainly in the 1920s men were expected to be a, a certain way and, and he wasn't actually like that so he built up this persona to pretend to be a real man um and it all sort of backfired on him really so I enjoyed writing him because he was quite a complex character. It was really interesting yeah I really liked that. Thank mm. you yeah. So from yeah from my perspective uh with Pete and Louise I wanted to show yes and we touched on it earlier the immense pressure and it and it is um of you've got that 
person who relies on you, that child that relies on you absolutely. And one of you's had to give up your job and the other one's having to work harder to make more money. And so you've got essentially a sort of a partially absent parent and you've got um, another one who's there all the time and can't really get away. And that causes enormous resentment, I, I think, across the board. I mean, I, I think any couple put in that position would struggle. And so I explored that. And then I also put gene therapy in the mix and then it all kind of went boom, you know. I mean, they're, they're really struggling anyway. So the balance is tipped. But their relationship, you know, what you do see is a couple who love each other deeply and who've been together for a long time and, and but have just come at it and diff, come at fixing or trying to fix a problem from completely different directions. I think that's really normal. Um, and um, and I, but they are both likable characters, although you were, you touched on it earlier as well about the mum, the tiger mum thing or whatever. And um, my mum often says, you know, she feels like, like a lioness, you know, and she, she has to fight for everything. People who've got disabled children fight for all provision for, for to get a diagnosis, to get, you know, equipment, blah, blah, blah. And so you have to become someone who doesn't care if people don't like you very much because you've just got to get things for your child. And so if Louise comes across ever as a bit like that, it's because I think that's quite true to life. Mm. De you definitely felt that you know it's relatable you could relate to them you could relate to their relationship ways but you could see the love underneath you know mm. and and the same in yours Louise but I wanted to know both of you have drawn on family experience and things that you've been through and there is that old thing of you know write about what you want to know but I want to know was it cathartic or did it emotionally drain you or was it a bit of both Victoria we'll start with you uh it was cathartic I didn't find it emotionally draining. I felt like I've been waiting to write this book and it, it just came out. I mean, I have to say the characters are not me and they're not my parents. There is some of our own experience in there, but they are fictional characters. But putting out some of my feelings about being a sibling of a disabled person, my fears and my worries, the things I've thought about for a long time. And after I'd finished, I realized I'd essentially written it so I could spend all those months in my sister's head or what I imagine is her head, getting to know her better. And it felt good so yeah cathartic definitely and Louise yeah for me I think it was a mixture this book always needed to be written but I couldn't write it until there was distance um because it was too painful um my my daughter is now a teenager and she is I mean she is way way better and it's all much you know it's all good so so I felt able to write it um I found I did find the research quite grueling um, for the reasons I explained earlier. It was just um, things were were really the way the characters in a, were described in the, all the case notes was was quite brutal at times and at best matter of fact. And that was quite upsetting. There was a real absence of love for these people. I found that quite difficult. But yeah, I'm glad I wrote it. Brilliant. And uh, both your books are sort of getting towards the end now um, had a both sort of overriding sense of hope, actually. Um, so was this intentional to sort of create that, that there was this feeling of hope towards the end? Victoria? Yeah, there's always hope. Um, that's what you cling to. That's what you, you gets you through every day. And with Rett syndrome, there really is because gene therapy is is and there are also um, various uh, medical treatments being um, tested as well at the moment. So there, there are there is hope and there's also love. And I really want to show the power of unconditional love, love within families and what that can actually do and the power it has, which I believe to be immense. So that's kind of the message I wanted to get across is even in the darkest times, you know, love shines out and gets into all of the dark corners. It definitely, definitely comes through <laughs> and I'm not going to spoil anything for anybody. Um, Louise, how yeah. do you sort of feel about that? Yeah, I, I, the same thing with love that's actually in both of my books and I, I totally agree with Victoria. Love is an immensely powerful thing. Um, and for me, I, the part of the reason I set it in the 1920s was there was a treatment um, which was is still used today and is quite effective and that was part of the reason why I wanted to set it then so that I could realistically I, I don't want to be untrue to history realistically um, have a more positive upbeat finish to the book.
And um, before we go, that that's just so, you know, I think both of you, after all your research and after all, you know, going through the emotional roller coaster, which I feel with both books, because there are so many twists and turns, you know, particularly in yours, Victoria, that it's nice to sort of have that feeling, that overwhelming feeling. And just wanted to know, drawing back to sort of real life, if you like, away from fiction, you both wrote these books during lockdown. So if we're talking about hope and love, there's nothing like the last year and a bit, is there? How, where did you get your support? Because I believe that you were sort of in author groups and so on. Um, how did you cope with all that and getting that inspiration during hard times? We're both um, members of um, the debut groups, Debut 20 and Debut 21 on Facebook, and they are amazing groups of authors. Um, are they not, Louise? They are absolutely brilliant. We had, um, we still do have weekly Zoom uh, chats um, to just talk about everything that, st that started up over lockdown, and it was just amazingly supportive. And we all shout for each other's books and read each other's books and um yeah it's been an absolute godsend over the over the difficult times and actually we're managing to sort of meet in person again, uh, for the first time yeah. now like there have been some group like the harrogate uh yeah squad met up yeah. recently and stuff which is really nice yeah <laughs> And it is, there's nothing like it. I worked in with, you know, working in journalism, you sort of work in different realms, don't you? I've never known so much about this, like this author love. It's really genuine and everybody is so supportive of each other's work. It's really lovely. You're not competing sort of with see. each other. There's more you know? than enough room for all of us and all our books are different. So it's it's just immensely supportive. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. So we're going to go to some questions now, I believe, that we've got come through. So we'll just wait for the first one. So a question for Louise. Um, will you continue writing historical fiction? Uh, that's a really good question because um, I never really set out to do to be a historical fiction writer, but it just happened that my first book was historical fiction. Um, and so uh, publishers kind of like you to write similar sort of stuff so for the moment I'm writing historical fiction but certainly I fully intend to write other things going forward. Brilliant that sounds exciting. <laughs> so um, Natalie's asked with such personal stories how difficult was the editing process for you both? I imagine it must have felt at times almost surgical in process. I think editing's hard for all writers. You know, you think you've presented them with a really good book and then they come back and say, it's really good, but you need to do this, this, this and this. And and, and actually journalism really helps because I'm used to people going through like with the metaphor from Red Pen and going, no, 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 change it. So actually for me personally, I just, I you know, I, I probably sit, have a cup of tea and they go, yeah, they're right and kind of get on with it. But um, it is hard if it's personal. Because um, if, if something comes out that, you know, you really felt a connection to, I think that hurts. But I think in the end, um, editors are clever people and you can usually see why they wanted something cut. So, you know. yeah, oh, yeah. I think I think with any book, any book that you write, whether it's from a personal perspective or not, is, is your baby kind of thing. So um, your response is probably the same. And I find when I get my editing notes the first day, I'm like all emotional about it. But then it's just a job. And you just get on and do them and um and actually the book always ends up being much better so now that i understand the process it's i quite enjoy it <laughs> brilliant and let's see if we've got another question so do you have a favorite book of all time question to both of you okay so we'll start with louise oh um <laughs> i have so many <laughs> um i oh gosh can i mention a couple um i love all the light we cannot see um the kite runner i love i really love books that just totally open my eyes to things um so those are the ones that spring to mind straight away over to victoria um, yeah for me it's two <laughs> books that i read i guess in my really emotional kind of heady teenage and early 20s kind of years that have stuck um, Howard's End, um, which deals with really big kind of societal issues and stuff, um, inequality and things. And, and these are issues, I mean, as a journalist, I've really got into, I, I'm a campaigning journalist, I've really cared deeply about issues. It's kind of what motivates the subject matters for my book. So it kind of that and um, Brideshead Revisited, which um, deals with um, lots of issues about faith and what that means and what family means and 
Um, yeah, so those sorts of things um, stick with me and, and various quotes have stuck with me forever from, the, from both of those books. So yeah, I cherish my copies of those. They're a bit dog-eared now, actually, not very well cherished. <laughs> it's nice when you get your vintage books out there, isn't it? Yeah. I've got a Flossy Tea Cakes book that I've had since I was little and that's just brilliant. <laughs> I've had to be very careful with it. Um, just before we go to the last question, I've got one more that I wanted to ask and that was, do you feel that you've learned anything from writing your novels like what's the biggest thing that you've learned from that whole process yourself Victoria oh golly uh that I can actually create realistic fictional characters which for me I mean I've been a journalist you know I've written about real people for so long um and I've loved the process of, of creating somebody who's who's multifaceted and has a past and a future and thinks different things to me and has a different experience and that's amazing I mean, what an amazing thing to be able to do for a job. And Louise? Yeah, I I think I've learned to trust in the process of writing a novel. So for me, know it, my first drafts are always a complete and utter mess and they're awful, but I know that it's going to get better and that gives you faith in the process. And I think that's probably the most important thing Mm. is trusting it <laughs> brilliant excellent thank you louise and victoria we've got one more question left so let's see what that is so lauren do you have any superstitions about writing like needing to write at a certain time of the day or with a specific pen <laughs> who wants to go first <laughs> Uh, I'll start. Uh, no, because if I did, I don't think I'd get anything done. I can't allow myself to do that. I just have to write around whatever is going on. Um, I, and my preference is to walk the dog and then sit down and write because somehow that walking just gets my mm. brain in the right place to sit down and work. Um, but it's not that I have to, but I prefer to do it that way. Yeah, I don't either. And this might be because I have two small children and really like I write in snatches. I write when I've got time. So I write, you know, in the corner of the kitchen while I'm cooking. I, I write on my laptop while I'm waiting for my daughter to finish ballet. Um, I write on my phone when I've got just a few seconds and I've thought of something. You know, there's, there's a whole file on my phone of ideas for books and stuff, characters yeah. and things. So, no, I can't be be like that I have to be spontaneous uh, it's the only way I get things done <laughs> super juggling mum Victoria yeah. um very last question if there was one thing that you wanted your reader to take from your books when they're reading it what would it be just one word or one thing um who wants to go first Lauren I mean, where am I? <laughs> Louise. Um, I would say That's discussion. That question was Lauren, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's <raining. laughs> Louise. Just in one word, discussion. I'm going oh, go, to go for the phrase that's on the front of my book. It's more than one word. Normal doesn't exist. We are all extraordinary. I love that. I need I need those up in my office <laughs> now. <laughs> That's brilliant. And I'm thinking, Louise, you've got more books than me. I have got other bookcases over there, but I'm trying to see how many you've got. <laughs> Some of them are quite dull. They're like <laughs> Wisdom <laughs> Cricket that are belong to Oh, uh, really? And oh. I've got other bookshelves as well. I should reorganise them. <laughs> brilliant. Well, Thanks to both Louise and Victoria for their insight and inspiration. The Hidden Child, Emotive Historical Fiction at its Best, is publishing on September the 2nd. And Patience, crammed with so many twists that as a reader, you just couldn't be sure how things would work out. No spoilers here. So check on the links below where to buy the books. Thanks for joining us virtually. I'm Claire Gill, journalist, editor, podcaster, and all things books. Thanks to Head of Zeus for setting up this wonderful evening and see you soon for another book conversation. Thank you very much, ladies. Thank you. Goodbye.